speak in the symposium. Um, so the relative importance of simple versus quantitative traits uh, in evolution has been sort of a, a point of tension in population genetics since the turn of the 20th century, when figures like William Bateson and some of his Mendelian colleagues argued in favor of discontinuous variant, uh, discontinuous variation, so large effect alleles, whereas Raphael Weldon and some of his colleagues uh, sort of dismiss uh, large effect mutations as rare aberrations and focus instead on quantitative traits. So there, uh, much of the controversy was subsided with Weldon's death in 1906, but real progress wouldn't come until 1918 when Ari Fisher published his foundational paper demonstrating how quantitative traits could arise from the combined contributions of many uh, independent Mendelian factors. Um, and thanks to Fisher and sort of the century of work since him, uh, we now understand very well in theory how uh, quantitative traits arise from these Mendelian factors and how if we select on quantitative traits, we expect the response at the genetic level to come <coughs> as a set of correlated responses um, very many small allele frequency changes across these many low sets that underlie these traits. Um, it's therefore somewhat striking that many of our population genetic success stories correspond to uh, individual mutations of large effect and large allele frequency changes. Um, so clearly Bateson is indicated, right? But surely Weldon must have been right as well, right? So anthropologists, for example, have noticed uh, traits like bi iliac breadth, so that's the width of your hips at the widest point, um, have this strong correlation with latitude with the potential adaptive explanation being that uh, at uh, northern latitudes, populations tend to evolve uh, wider bodies as a way to decrease their surface area to mass ratio in order to conserve heat. Right? So compare, for example, these Messiah individuals native to equatorial Africa with this Tlingit individual from uh, coastal Alaska. So there's a couple of potential <laughs> issues with this kind of evidence. Um, one of which, so one of which is that uh, we can't necessarily control for the fact. Or we, uh, so one of which is, is the issue that uh, these individuals are measured in different environments, right? And so we can't necessarily exclude the explanation that uh, differences in environments among populations are responsible for the differences in the phenotypes that we observe. Uh, the other potential issue is that. These populations are not independent due to common ancestry, right? And so, it, we can't also we can't necessarily exclude the explanation that this pattern we is plausibly adapted with the pattern that we see might be due to genetic drift in a relatively small number of populations or ancestral to these present day populations, for example. Right? And so, um, we could potentially get around these issues if we knew the loci that, under, that, that are responsible for variation in a trait like bioiliac breath or some other then we could check whether the uh, loci which increased the trait value were at higher frequencies in northern populations, and we could do so with a model of allele frequency change that accounts for the non-independence of the population. So today I'm going to tell you about some work we've been doing over the last couple of years to do just that. The engine which makes all this possible is GMI Association Studies, or GWAS for short. Um, and so the basic idea is quite simple. Uh, you take, uh, you measure phenotypes for a very large number of individuals across the population, you genotype them in a dense array of markers, and then use a linear model to uh, try to estimate effect sizes for individual markers and identify markers which are strongly associated with the trait. And this sort of generates this relatively famous now Manhattan plot, where um, so each of these towers, sort of this is the log 10 p value for the association of the traits. So each of these towers here corresponds to a small region of the genome where we think that there is a mutation associated with the trait. Um, and one of, so the the effect size estimate here that we get out of these is going to be particularly useful for us. Um, so with the help of our collaborators, Claude Bearer and Joe Pickerel at the New York Genome Center, we've compiled a list of, uh, well, here I'm going to show you data from 27 published uh, GWAS studies that we then intersected with allele frequency data from two different data sets. One, the 1,000 genomes data, which is a set of uh, high quality uh, full genomes, about 100 individuals per population. And then another data set, the human origin data set, which includes about 10 individuals per population, over 160 populations, 
that are genotyped on a chip and for which we've then imputed full genome sequences using the thousand genomes as a reference. Okay, so we're almost there. We just need to make a couple of uh, sort of decisions about uh, chiefly how to decide which loci we actually think are associated with the trait. And so we make a couple of uh, sort of arbitrary but useful decisions, which one, the first is that we assume a polygenic architecture and we chop the genome up into 1,700 uh, non-overlapping blocks and we assume that there's one, uh, one SNP in each block that's associated with the trait. And so we just take whichever SNP has the smallest p-value for association with the trait and label that as a variant which contributes to the to variation in the, the trait of interest. And so we get our effect size estimate and we take a product of the effect size estimate and the allele frequency for any given population, sum those across all 1700 blocks and that gives us a genetically derived prediction of the average <coughs> value in a particular population. And when I say prediction, I want to be clear that what I mean is essentially that we're doing an in silico common garden experiment. That it's a prediction of what the phenotype, what the mean phenotype of individuals in that population would be if we could raise them in the environment in which the GWAS was done. Um, the other nice thing about these is that they are truly additive, and so sort of all of the assumptions of classic quantitative Um, okay, so to make this more concrete, here I'm showing you um, the distribution of our height genetic uh, predictions across all of these populations. So blue indicates the prediction of greater height, and red in indicates the prediction of shorter populations. Um, and uh, so if I wanted to ask whether two populations were whether natural selection is responsible for differentiation between any particular pair of populations, for example, <coughs> British and Spanish here, I can calculate the essential statistic, um, where the, we have a formula for the uh, total added genetic variance shared between those two populations, and that turns out to be essentially a QST-FST comparison. So FST from neutral markers uh, distributed across the genome, and QST is the sort of quantitative genetic analog of FST. So these should, this ratio should be one, or I the expectation is one under neutrality, and it has a chi-square distribution uh, under the neutral model. Um, so that's a pairwise uh, analysis, but we actually, we sort of, you know, we want to be able to deal with the non-independence among these populations, and so um, it turns out that the natural multivariate uh, generalization of QST-FST comparisons is to, is, is to model uh, this vector of our genetic predictions as multivariate normal, where we have this F matrix is sort of like the multivariate generalization of FST, describing the neutral relatedness among populations that we can estimate from a large number of, uh, of neutral SNPs across the genome. I'm not going to talk any more about this other than to say that the basic method is published. And to note that it's essentially what we're doing is the same thing as what you do in comparative phylogenetics when you ask whether you can reject uh, a single rate rounding motion model. Statistically, these are basically equivalent. Okay. And so um, here I'm showing you on the y-axis, the uh, on a negative log scale, the p-value describing our ability to reject the neutral model for these various different traits. Um, the one-to-one -one line here is where we would expect all of them to lie if everything was bulk neutral. Right? And so clearly height is our strongest outlier, but we've got uh, you know some a, a number of other traits that sort of lift off this line a little bit. Um, Today I'm going to focus on these three, so height, hip circumference, and waist hip ratio. Um, I already showed you the figure for height, the distributions of height across the world, and I'm going to focus on that first. And uh, if you've been looking closely at this figure, you might have picked out one particularly striking pattern, it's this west to east gradient across your Asia, right? And just to make sure that I'm not playing tricks on you with the colors, here I'm plotting our uh, genetic predictions of height against uh, longitude. Uh, for only Eurasian populations, so here's sort of Europe, the Middle East, uh, East Asia. Okay. So that's a rather striking climb, right? Um, so next I'm going to show you a series of pairwise comparisons where I'm comparing, uh, uh, so in, in, in this figure, the color of the square, the square will be blue if the row population has a larger genetic value than the the column population and the darkness of the color corresponds to our ability to reject the neutral model and have a particular pairwise 
And so what, here what we see is uh, this is a sort of already known result that there's sele been selection for increased height in northern Europe relative to southern Europe. Um, so that's good that we can reproduce that. But as we move eastward, we also notice that if you compare, for example, Spanish with uh, Middle Eastern populations, you can also reject the neutral model in that comparison. If you compare Middle Eastern populations like Palestinians and Iranians to the Han Chinese, we can also, so, you know, this blue is not as dark as that blue, but that's still a p-value of like 10 to minus 5. So we can also reject the neutral model in that comparison. Um, one particularly interesting result that I didn't expect was that we see in these two coastal Alaskan populations, the Aleut and the Tlingit, we see evidence of selection for increased height in them relative to their uh, East Asian relatives. And that comparison also holds if you compare them to other Native American populations. Okay? So the punchlines from the analysis of height here is that we see uh, natural selection across very many loci, so at least partially responsible for acquiring height from west to east across Eurasia. Um, if we sort of go in and look at the individual allele frequencies and just compare, for example, the British and the Han Chinese, um, the height increase in the allele is at about five and a half percentage points greater frequency in the British than in the Han. So these are really, you know, relatively small allele frequency changes um, across a very large number of loci, right? And we also see at least one independent episode of selection outside of Eurasia in these coastal Alaskan populations. Um, okay, so that was height. Now I'm going to show you uh, data for hip circumference, um, which is. So hip circumference is a particularly interesting trait because it, uh, there's published estimates of the within population genetic correlation between height and hip circumference that are about 0.04. Um, particularly if we focus on Eurasia, you'd be forgiven for thinking that I was showing you the height figure again. Um, indeed, if we just plot these against one another, hip circumference on this axis versus our height genetic scores on this axis, you see they're very strongly correlated. And after uh, accounting for population structure, the among population correlation in these genetic scores is actually just about equivalent to what we see for the within population. Um, and so we take this particularly uh, in concert with the, the observation that the signal is much stronger in height than in hip circumference. We take this as evidence for a correlated response to selection on height in hip circumference. Um, and lastly, let's see if I can get through it in the time I have remaining, um, waist to hip ratio. Whereas hip circumference is pretty strongly correlated with height, waist to hip ratio is not. Um, so here I'm showing you minimum temperature in the coldest month uh, on this axis, and our waist to hip ratio genetic scores on this axis. Um, you know, there's a sort of striking fact that there are populations that live in relatively warm environments that have small waist to hip ratio scores, whereas in the colder environments, these are absent, right? And so uh, much of our signal comes from two comparisons. One is this set of Iberian populations compared to Central Asian relatives, and uh, a second comparison of Northern European populations like the Finns and the Russians compared to their European relatives. And so we think that this is uh, evidence of uh, independent evolution of increased waist hip ratio in colder environments in both Northern Europe and in Northeast Asia, uh, consistent with the sort of uh, thermodynamic hypotheses of that deconstruction. Okay. And so that is all I have today. I'm happy to take questions if I have.